Hello and welcome. In this presentation, I will explain the tyrannical nature of the global money system. I will describe how it has evolved and how it functions and how we can free ourselves from its grip. Let's begin with a thought experiment. Can you imagine having total control over the creation of money? That you can create as much of it as you want? That you can give it or lend it to whomever you want? That you can spend it in any way you want? That you can make people pay to get it and use it? That you can take people's property when they are unable to pay it back? And fail to pay it back, they must, because the way it is designed. You win by collecting interest when they repay their loans, and you win by taking their collateral assets when they fail to pay. That is the power that is now in the hands of an elite superclass of bankers, corporatists, and politicians. It is said that the best way to rob a bank is to own one. That gives the owners the power to lend selectively to themselves and to their allies on favorable terms to purchase and accumulate real assets. And we have allowed this to happen. So it is up to us to reclaim the money power for the benefit of all. Now let's take a look at the dysfunctional aspects of the political money regime. Most of the money in circulation is improperly issued. Vast amounts are created for corporate bailouts, lavish financing of asset purchases by elites, obscene amounts of weaponry, wars, and regime change campaigns all around the world. Money does not go where it is most deserved and needed. It costs too much because of the interest and excessive fees that banks charge. The money supply and interest rates are manipulated for the benefit of its controllers, creating a power elite and wealthy superclass, enabling them to centralize power and concentrate wealth in their own hands, thus undermining democratic government and creating class conflict and forcing artificial economic growth that erodes the social fabric and destroys the environment. The money power has become the supreme power throughout the material world. Here are a few pertinent quotes. Male Amschel Rothschild, the patriarch of the Rothschild banking and political dynasty, has said, Give me the power to create a nation's money, and I care not who makes its laws. Former U.S. President James Garfield said, Whoever controls the volume of money in any country is absolute master of all industry and commerce. And Sir Reginald McKenna, former president of the Midland Bank in England, once said, Those who create and issue money and credit direct the policies of government and hold in the hollow of their hands the destiny of the people. And famed economist John Kenneth Galbraith has written, The study of money, above all other fields in economics, is one in which complexity is used to disguise the truth or to evade truth, not to reveal it. And this quote, although rather lengthy, is particularly relevant to what has come to be called the New World Order. This is from Professor Carol Quigley, who was a Georgetown University professor and mentor to former President Bill Clinton. This is from his 1966 book, Tragedy and Hope, a history of the world in our times. He wrote, The powers of financial capitalism had another far-reaching aim, nothing less than to create a world system of financial control in private hands, able to dominate the political system of each country and the economy of the world as a whole. This system was to be controlled in a feudalist fashion, by central banks of the world acting in concert, by secret agreements arrived at in frequent private meetings and conferences. The apex of the system was to be the Bank for International Settlements in Basel, Switzerland, a private bank 
owned and controlled by the world's central banks, which were themselves private corporations. And pay particular interest to this part. Each central bank sought to dominate its government by its ability to control treasury loans, to manipulate foreign exchanges, to influence the level of economic activity in the country, and to influence cooperative politicians by subsequent economic rewards in the business world. So how has all this come about? Part of it is by ignorance and part by design. There is a general but false belief that the money power must be centralized in the hands of the state. Bankers and politicians long ago joined forces to increase their own power and wealth. The interest, actually usury, that is built into the money creation process creates an artificial deficiency of money in circulation available to repay the debts that continually grow day by day and year by year as interest charges are compounded. And as pointed out before, economic and political control become ever more centralized and democratic government is corrupted. But because people do not understand how the money system operates, they clamor for government to intervene to relieve their distress. So let us next consider what we need to know about money. What is money anyway? What is its basic purpose? What is wrong with the money system we now have? And what are the economic, social, political, and environmental implications of the political money system? And how can we conduct business without political money? Anyone who has ever taken a course in economics or money and banking will have been taught that money is three things. A medium of exchange, a measure of value, and a store of value. But even if that were correct, it describes what money does, not what money is. But that is not correct. Money is essentially a credit instrument, that is, a debt obligation or promise by the issuer to deliver some valued goods or services in exchange for it later on. Its fundamental purpose is to facilitate the exchange of goods or services that are in the market. When you think about it, it becomes apparent that if money is a medium of exchange, it must be spent. If it is a store of value, it must be held or saved. And once we realize that money is a credit instrument or claim on real value, it becomes obvious that the money, that is the currency, cannot measure itself. It must be denominated in terms of some real commodity or group of commodities. The beginning of the modern system of political money and banking goes back more than 300 years to the founding of the Bank of England. In 1694, King William III was fighting a war against France. And of course, war is a very expensive proposition. And the king needed to find a way to finance the war without raising taxes to impossible levels. At that time, William Patterson and his cohorts came to the king and persuaded him to charter their Bank of England. They agreed to provide the king with all the money he might need for the war if the king would allow the Bank of England to print banknotes and lend them into circulation at interest. From that point onward, the central banking model gradually spread to every country around the world. This unholy alliance between government and banking has evolved into a banking cartel that holds a monopoly on the allocation of credit, which allows the bankers to collect interest on every dollar, euro, pound, and other political currency by lending it into circulation, and has enabled all of the major developed countries of the world to run budget deficits year after year and continually add to their national debt without any intention to ever pay it off. The United States is the prime example of that absurd charade. This graph clearly and dramatically shows the explosion of national debt, but it even understates the extent of the problem 
because it is out of date. It only shows the debt up to 2020, at which time the U.S. national debt amounted to $23 trillion. But the box in the lower left of the slide shows the more recent number, which is $32.6 trillion. That's way off the chart. But a similar pattern can be seen to one degree or another for other large Western and Asian countries. Since these sovereign debts will never be repaid, they are not debts at all, but simply a record of the amount of value that has been appropriated by the government outside of the formal taxing structure. Thus, it is really a tax that is levied indirectly on everyone who has savings or other claims that are denominated in political money units. That tax is felt in the diminishing purchasing power of political fiat monies. I have long argued that honest money must be issued on the basis of real goods and services that the issuer is ready, willing, and able to deliver now or in the very near future. But the world is being flooded with enormous sums of political pseudo-money that promise nothing at all. Famed economist John Kenneth Galbraith has said, The process by which banks create money is so simple the mind is repelled. That is absolutely true, and I've prepared this visual image to show the utter simplicity with which banks create money when they make loans. Let us suppose that you go to a bank and request a mortgage loan to buy a house. The bank loan officer will examine your credit rating and history, as well as your employment status and income, and will perhaps approve your application. The bank will then make two entries to its books. The mortgage note that you sign that acknowledges your indebtedness will be entered as an asset, and the bank will also enter an equal amount as a deposit to your account, which is a liability to the bank. Where did the bank get the money to make that deposit to your account? People have been led to believe that they get it from depositors' savings, but that is not true. Actually, the bank, by making two entries on its books, has created brand new money. But there is a serious problem with this system. The banks charge interest, actually usury, on all loans, so the amount each borrower owes increases simply with the passage of time but only the principal amount was created. Where will you get enough money to pay both the amount you borrowed, that is the principal, plus the accrued interest? You can only do so by competing in the market with other borrowers who are in the same predicament. As interest on loans accrues, the supply of money in the economy that is available for repayment becomes deficient compared to the total amount of debts. It is certain that some must default, losing both their equity and their property through foreclosure. Why does every country have a central bank? We are told that the objectives of central banks are one, to maintain a stable value of the money, that is, to protect its purchasing power, and two, to maintain full employment. But under this interest-based debt money regime, those objectives are mutually contradictory and can never be achieved simultaneously. The interest must be paid one way or the other, either by inflating the money supply with pseudo-money that is improperly issued or by making credit scarce and expensive, allowing the banks to bankrupt borrowers and take their property causing small businesses to close, workers to lose their jobs and income, and a waste of resources. They apply both of these tactics in alternating fashion to pump income and wealth from the general population to those who control the system. The true purpose of central banks is twofold. First, to enable the monopolization of credit and the practice of usury by the banking cartel, and two, 
to enable profligate deficit spending by national governments. They do this by means of legalized counterfeiting, that is, the creation of improperly issued pseudo-money that is supported by legal tender and other laws that force acceptance of debased national currencies and make it difficult for other currencies and means of exchange to compete. So let's sum it up. We have seen that money is nothing but credit. But banks, collectively, in collusion with central governments, control access to credit, and they decide who gets access to credit and on what terms. They charge interest on all loans and require collateral. But because of the interest charged, there is never enough money in circulation to allow all loans to be repaid. Banks throttle the credit allocation process, alternating easy and cheap credit with scarce and expensive credit, both of which exploit users in different ways. Central governments, for their part, get to spend as much as they wish without regard to the amount of tax or other revenues collected. They can borrow as much as they wish to wage wars of domination, play favorites, and increase their power over states, provinces, and lower levels of government, and they never repay what is owed. They simply roll it over and keep adding to it. This deficit spending causes debasement of its monetary unit, which causes a rise in the general level of prices commonly referred to as inflation. At the same time, by becoming the borrower of last resort, national governments keep the money supply pumped up to avoid severe economic depressions. This is the Keynesian approach to government intervention. The interest, inflation, and most taxes that are imposed at the national level are parasitic drains on the economy and resources that could be used to serve human needs are wasted. But it is within our power to reclaim the credit commons. We the people, by means of collaborative community action, can give birth to a new, more sustainable and equitable economy, and in the process enable the emergence of a new civilization of global peace and harmony and a dignified life for everyone. Consider the ways in which value can be transferred. It occurs to me that there are three possibilities. We can give or receive a gift in which there is no demand or expectation by the giver of receiving anything in return, or a transfer can be coerced by threats, intimidation, or legal demand, as it is with theft, robbery, extortion, and most taxes, or it can be by a voluntary agreement amongst traders to reciprocate. In the realm of reciprocal exchange, we expect to give as much value as we get and to get as much value as we give when we exchange one form of value for another. This is the realm in which markets and money play their role. Simple barter does not require money, but it does require that each party have something the other wants. That's why money was invented. It serves as a placeholder that enables the one who first surrenders value to get what they want, not only from the receiver, but from anyone else in the market. Now we have all become habituated to using some form of political fiat money that is provided by the established powers. But there are better, tried and true ways of enabling reciprocal exchange that allow us to begin the process of transcending the dysfunctional and destructive political money regime. As pointed out earlier, money, or currency, is merely a credit instrument or evidence of something owed. It follows, therefore, that it is producers and providers of real valued goods and services that are qualified to receive credit. They get credit from the community by spending their own vouchers into circulation and having others accept them as payment. 
Those vouchers then become homegrown exchange media that others can also use to conduct their own transactions in the market. Another mechanism for making payments without using political fiat money is for producers to organize into credit clearing circles in which their debts from purchases are offset by their credits from sales. Both of these mechanisms provide reliable sources of credit and enable completion of the reciprocity circuit without involving banks and governments. What is the reciprocity circuit? I will show that in the next slide. This diagram illustrates the reciprocity circuit, which is comprised of the issuance, circulation, and redemption of a voucher currency. Here we show in the box at the upper right a trusted producer of valued goods or services. It could be a manufacturer, a retailer, a utility company, or even a municipal government. It begins the process by offering to pay its employees, suppliers, and contractors partly with its own vouchers in place of conventional money. They in turn will spend the vouchers onward by offering them as payment to merchants, service providers, and businesses of all kinds in the community who will accept them because they are fully backed by the goods and services that the issuer has promised to deliver when the vouchers are ultimately redeemed. In the meantime, they can circulate any number of times within the community before being redeemed, at which point the reciprocity circuit has been completed and the vouchers are retired. Private voucher currencies and credit clearing circles are nothing new. There have been many examples throughout history, as well as currently. Here are a few of them. During the 19th century, some railway companies in Europe paid out their own vouchers for labor and supplies and redeemed them for tickets to ride the railroad. During the Great Depression in both the Americas and Europe, a great many entities circulated their own script to use in place of official money that was in short supply. In Switzerland, during the same period, small businesses came together to form their own credit clearing circle called the VIR. Canadian Tire Money is a rebate currency that has been issued by a private company in Canada since the mid-1950s. The past several decades have seen the emergence of scores of commercial trade exchanges that are operating successfully around the world to provide credit clearing services to small and medium-sized businesses. At the grassroots level, we have less systems, time banks that issue their own time dollars, and a great many communities in various places have created their own local currencies. And in Argentina, there have been numerous trading clubs and provinces that have created their own currencies. Here, I wish to elaborate a bit on a few of those exchange options that I mentioned in the previous slide. In the upper left is an image of a Depression-era currency called Larkin Merchandise Bonds. These were emitted by a chain of retail stores that operated in the western part of New York State. With dollars in short supply, the Larkin Company opted to pay its employees and suppliers, in part, in its own vouchers, which it then redeemed later when it accepted them back in payment for whatever merchandise the bearer wished to buy. Being fully backed by real value, these vouchers worked quite well as exchange media. On the right is an image of a rebate certificate that the Canadian Tire Company has been giving out in various forms to customers since the 1950s. When a customer buys something at any of the company's stores, they receive a small percentage of the purchase price back as a voucher that can be redeemed when they make a subsequent purchase. Like Larkin vouchers, Canadian Tire Money has been known to circulate alongside official money when people use it to pay for taxi fares and other private debts. During the 1990s, the financial system in Argentina broke down, banks were closed, 
and people were unable to access their money, and unemployment skyrocketed, even among the middle class and educated professionals. As usually happens when people become desperate, they also become creative. They began to organize trading clubs that issued their own currencies called credito notes. For many people, these clubs were absolutely necessary for survival. During my visit there in 2001, I met with leaders and participants of several clubs and had the opportunity to attend a couple of the many trading fairs that were held every day of the week. I saw hundreds of traders buying and selling goods and services and paying each other entirely with credito notes issued by the various clubs. It was very exciting and impressive. Now let's look at credit clearing among buyers and sellers. How does it work? In the money economy, we earn money by selling something. Quite often that's our labor. We then spend that money to get what we need or want. But money is just an intermediate device or a placeholder. But in reality, it is our labor that has paid for the things that we buy. In a credit clearing circle, we eliminate the need for money. Everyone is both a buyer and a seller. As a seller, we earn credits by providing goods or services to other participants in our clearing circle. Then, as a buyer, we spend those credits to receive goods and services from others in the circle. Earnings from sales offset expenditures for purchases directly without the use of money. In business terminology, our accounts receivable offset our accounts payable, which eliminates the need for money. The credits that we circulate within the circle can be thought of as our own internal currency. This diagram shows the clearing process pictorially. We have an association or clearing circle represented by the oval, which includes two classes of members, issuing members and non-issuing members. The participants use their own credit within a network of trust. An issuing member is a seller who has a sufficient supply of goods or services that are in continuous demand. They are allowed to spend up to some limit before they earn credits by selling. Their account can have a negative balance on the account ledger. A non-issuing member is a seller whose offerings are less in demand and is therefore required to sell before they buy. Their account balance must always be positive. All accounts begin with a balance of zero. The process begins when an issuing member uses their credit line to buy something from one of the other members. That other member can then use those credits to buy what they want from someone else, who can use the credits to buy what they want from still someone else. So you can see that the same credits can enable a great many trades before they come back to the original issuing member to bring their balance back towards zero. Account balances fluctuate upwards and downwards as sales and purchases are made. They need not get all the way back to zero, but must never exceed their predetermined limits. Perhaps the best example we have of a successful credit clearing system is the Veer Business Circle Cooperative that was mentioned earlier. It was founded in the midst of the Great Depression in 1934 by a group of small business operators who were looking for a way to continue to do business with one another despite the shortage of Swiss francs that were available to circulate at that time. Veer continued to thrive even after the Depression had ended, and by the mid-1990s, membership and clearing activity were growing rapidly. But for some reason, the Veer management at that time decided to apply for a conventional bank charter and began to de-emphasize the direct clearing process in favor of conventional Swiss franc lending and deposits. The process of clearing VIR credits continues, but is now only a minor part of the bank's activity. This slide portrays just a few of the scores of commercial trade exchanges 
that have been operating in many countries around the world. Their trade association, the International Reciprocal Trade Association, IRTA, estimates the annual volume of credits cleared to be in the range of 12 to $14 billion annually. Most of that involves small and medium-sized business enterprises, and both the number of members and the volume of trading continue to grow. I'd like to conclude by suggesting some resources for you to consult to deepen your understanding of the exchange process and to learn more about the innovative approaches that I've been describing. My primary active website, beyondmoney.net, contains not only my own writings, presentations, and interviews, but also the works and resources from other important historical and contemporary sources. You might begin with a few that are listed in this slide. You can also keep up with my work by following me on Facebook and Twitter, which is now called X, and by subscribing to my YouTube channel. Thanks for watching.